Hello, my friend. Welcome to Growing in the Gospel. I'm Pastor Kerry, and you clicked play on a long-form teaching series, a new series called Healthy Church. We are discovering 10 principles or qualities that sustain healthy kingdom communities. And this is the first message in that series. It's simply entitled, A Healthy Church Grows a Gospel Culture. It's all about the good news of Jesus. So many churches have gone down so many rabbit holes and are on so many distracting trails. The The gospel of Jesus Christ should frame everything about our lives, about our churches, about our way of relating, about our mission, about our philosophy of ministry, our theology, our doctrine, all of it, all of it needs to be oriented around the gospel of Jesus with Jesus at the center. And so um, I hope you enjoy this message. I hope it will encourage and equip you and empower you. And I hope you'll pray with me that God will make your church and my church shaped this way after the gospel of Jesus. And so be encouraged by today's message. A healthy church grows a gospel culture. Right now we're going to start a new sermon series, and I want to introduce that. And I want to do that by asking you to turn uh, or in the notes or in your Bible to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 is where we're going to start today. The series that we're entering into now for the next 10 weeks is called Healthy Church. Ten values that sustain a kingdom community. And we're going at really two things. First of all, your, your own personal soul health as a believer and a follower of Jesus. And then how that collectively, corporately creates something called a body life or a culture, a church culture. And uh, so we're aiming at how does personal individual health spiritually kind of congregate into a, a body, a church that's healthy and thriving. And today, the first message is a healthy church grows a gospel culture, a gospel culture. And we're going to talk today about how it's all about the good news of Jesus. And the, the verse I want to start with, there's multiple passages here, but is Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. And I want you to read it with me in a moment, but I want to tell you the story that's behind this. Then we'll read it together. Jesus has, has been healing and traveling and teaching all across the northern part of Israel, and he goes to Nazareth. That's his hometown. It's where he grew up as a kid. And he goes into the synagogue at Nazareth, and he opens the, the scroll of Isaiah, and he stands up to teach and to read, and he reads this passage. Luke is quoting the passage that Jesus reads from Isaiah. He stops at a very critical point in the verse because the rest of the verse isn't yet fulfilled. But on this day, this first part of this verse began to be fulfilled. Jesus is the God-man. He's visiting the planet. The people in Nazareth, they don't believe that he's God. They don't believe that he's Messiah. They think he's actually delusional. They see him as the little kid that grew up around the corner. And they have a hard time seeing past that. So because of that, he doesn't heal. He doesn't do any miracles in Nazareth because they, they, they were unbelieving. But when he stands in the middle of these people and he reads this verse, he says to them, this day, right now, these scriptures are fulfilled right in front of your very eyes. I am who these scriptures are talking about. After he read this, they bound him up, they held him hostage, they took him out to a cliff, and they were going to kill him. He escaped because it wasn't time to die. And nobody, nobody kills Jesus. He lays down his life voluntarily. So... That's, the, that's the, the circumstances that surround these verses, but I just want you to gather this in your mind as we read it. He's standing in front of people who are struggling to believe who he is, who never really saw what he would have done had they believed. But what does he say to them? I want you to think about what he says to them because all of our church, all of our doing of ministry is built on these ideas. So let's read it out loud, verse 18, as it is in your outline. Uh, lift up your voice with me. Ready? Begin. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are God who came in a human body to
to show us the heart of God. And the heart of God, when you showed it to us, is good news to all of us. I pray that you will guide my words as I do my best to try to communicate that good news to some in the room who have never understood it and to others in the room who need to understand it afresh every single day. Set us free, Lord, from our performance-based hard work solutions, trying to save ourselves, trying to prove ourselves. Help us to collapse into the goodness of your good news and help us as a church to continue doing that. Help us to be framed and, and, and all about, dominated by this gospel, this good news. I pray for those that are hurting and suffering all around the world this morning. Israel, Lebanon, Gaza. I think of Florida and Tennessee and North Carolina. So many that are hurting, so many that are uh, at a loss. Lord, we need you, the world's a mess, and we need you. So teach us and grow us today. Give us hearts to hear, in Jesus' name, amen. So how many of you have ever heard the term doom scrolling? You know what I'm talking about? That's a great word. It's when you get on the news feed or when you get on social media and you just scroll and you're just consuming all the negative stuff, politics, natural disasters, wars, and you just, you just, you, you take out it in for 20 or 30 minutes or an hour and you just get a sense that everything is coming undone. I did a fair bit of doom scrolling this week. I don't like to do it, but I found myself doing it because I think the chaos that's unfolding around us sometimes is almost impossible to look away from. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, it's, all, it's like there's so many things happening on so many different fronts. Um, and my big assessment of it all is the world's a mess. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came to church for that? The world's a mess. But Jesus is hope. Just the last few days, I mean, I just made a quick list yesterday. Two of our U.S. warships were attacked in the Middle East. That almost didn't make the news because all the other news was so much bigger. Um, Iranian operatives apparently, if we're to believe the story, are in our country right now trying to assassinate a former president. Um, Israel is at war on two fronts and that war rapidly escalated in the last 36 hours. Dramatic events unfolding. Of course, Ukraine and Russia are still going at it. And on top of all that, our southern states are reeling from Helene. How many of you have been watching the news from the, from the storm? The storm has devastated Florida and then North Carolina and Tennessee. So um, it's, it's heavy. You think of the state of things and the time we're living in, there's a lot of heaviness. I came across a quote from Chuck Swindoll years ago in reference to the church. And he said, the church is like Noah's Ark. You wouldn't be able to stand the stink on the inside if it weren't for the storm on the outside. <laughs> That's the most uncomfortable laugh you've ever given in a second hour <laughs> service. You're like, hey, I don't stink. Listen, um, the fact is the church is a beautiful proposition, an idea, and an amazing thing but it's also a messy thing, like the ark. I mean, I'd rather been in the ark than in the storm, but if you play it out, the ark probably was pretty smelly, and there was a lot of problems probably going on in that ark too. So by contrast to the storm on the outside, I wanna begin this series by telling you as much as I believe and love the church, I've given my life to helping our church to be healthy and others. So as much as I'm incredibly optimistic and almost delusionally hopeful about the church, I'm also not naive. I've had people tell me, you're way too happy, Pastor. You're way too optimistic. Um, no, I'm actually just a realist, biblically speaking. I look at the, at the my, my worldview is interpreted through what Jesus said. But anyone who's followed Jesus for a long time and has stayed in church during that time probably has a sad or a bad church story to share. Many in this room, including me, 
have experienced some of the worst of humanity, not just outside the church, but actually inside the church. I'm not trying to open any wounds or rip off any bandages or open up any scars. A lot of folks have told me over the last 12 years that Emmanuel has been a place of renewal and healing for them after a bad experience. I uh, can tell you my first nine years of being a follower of Jesus from about eight years old to about, what is that, 17, you know, I was in a very healthy church. My first exposure to Jesus and the gospel was in a life-giving church full of broken, messy people, but people who were genuinely growing up in Jesus and genuinely loving one another and genuinely living by the things I'm going to teach in this series. So God gave me a real healthy first nine years, and, and so much so that even as a kid, I was nine years old when I was like, Lord, can I serve you? Can I help other people come into healthy church? Can I be a part of this? This is so wonderful. But then after that, I was a part of churches, numerous churches in my lifetime, that before I ever became a pastor, I experienced the worst. I mean, I'm talking about the worst, like bad things, immorality, financial impropriety, criminality, I mean, all kinds of terrible things that either as a, a teenager, my youth pastor, or as a, a congregant, just being a part of the church, the leadership, even as being a pastor and in the ministry, I've seen every kind of terrible thing that you can see. And it, by the way, it crosses all lines. It's in all organizations. It's in all tribes and denominations. And, and, and there's problems. You, can, you don't have to look very far to find problems or to experience them. But Anyone who has decided to build their faith in Jesus and not people, Jesus and not leaders, anyone who has decided that the church is not something you give up on, anyone who has truly anchored their faith into Jesus and his promises and has stayed and continued in healthy churches would also be able to occupy you for a long time with joyful, life-giving stories of their experience in healthy churches. I can tell you about terrible, terrible things, but I can by far, I mean by far, I can tell you about the wonderful experiences that I've had growing up and growing our family up in healthy churches. So I am a huge believer, not naive, but a fully informed believer in what the church is capable of by the promise and presence of Jesus. Unhealthy churches are abundant. Healthy churches are rare, and even more critically, healthy churches are difficult to keep healthy. Why? Well, there's two factors. There's a spiritual battle without. There's the assault of Satan and all of his forces, and we're all engaged in that battle all week long. But then there's the problems in our own hearts. There's the broken people on the inside of the ark. And sometimes we turn against each other, and suddenly what was healthy on the inside can become a precarious situation. But here's the thing. We have the supernatural promises and presence of Jesus in this thing called church. Jesus took his disciples at a moment when they believed that the movement was dying. Everybody was walking away. He took them up to a northern part of Israel to a city called Dan, and they went to this cult center where pagan worship and prostitution and child sacrifice had been done for centuries. And in the shadow of that place, Jesus said, guys, we're right on schedule. I came here to die. I came here to suffer and the gates of hell, that was the name of that place. The gates of hell will not, I'm gonna build my church. I'm gonna start and build and grow my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. And gates are a defensive measure. So Jesus was saying, my church will forever until I come be on the offense. It will be moving forward, it will be growing, it will be thriving, it will be changing lives and changing the world and growing my kingdom, assaulting the gates of the enemy and the gates of hell will not be able to stop it or hold it back. So, this series, 10 weeks, we're gonna explore how can we together bind ourselves in a covenant relationship with God, with Jesus, through the gospel, and to each other to keep ourselves and this church healthy. You guys okay? I keep hearing bells and whistles and stuff going off, so. Everybody take your phone and just like off, like silence it for a minute because we're trying, we want to focus, okay? Just help me focus. And you know, try to still the traffic. If you have an emergency, you need to leave, let's leave. But if you need to go get donuts, let's not leave, okay? 
I'm telling you, sometimes it's like, wait. Not upset at anybody. I just want you, I, I want you to focus in with me, okay? This is the most important thing we do as a church. Open God's word and let his word shape us. What is the church? I love these two quotes. They don't comprehensively say it, but they sure get a good run at it. The church is a society of sinners who have finally realized it and banded themselves together to do something about it. <laughs> I love that. The church. Now, Jesus really did the work. So what are we doing about it? We're encouraging and believing and growing and praying and seeking and encouraging each other. But we're a society, we'll go back, we're a society of sinners. We're broken, we're messy. We're messy people. If you think you're not messy, you are messy and delusional, so you have doubled the problems of everybody else. And if that's offensive to you, hey, welcome to humanity. You had to wake up and take a shower this morning, and we're glad you did. You had to wake up and brush your teeth this morning because the inside of your mouth smelled like the ark <laughs> when you woke up. So I'm, I'm not just talking about physiologically, though. Our, our struggles, we mask them well and, and, and wonderful, but we're all struggling. We're all growing. We're all in the same kind of lane. I love this quote. The church is the only organization in the world in which membership is based on the candidate admitting that he or she is unworthy of membership. First qualification to be a member of Jesus' church is admitting I'm not qualified. I don't deserve to be a member of the church that Jesus is growing. So our starting point today is a healthy church grows a gospel culture. I want to make a case in the next few minutes that a healthy church is dominated, it is qualified by, it is totally characterized by the gospel. Now help me out, somebody shout it out. If you know, what does the word gospel mean? Good news. Good news. All right, so I'm going to say good news a lot this sermon, this message. Good news, the word gospel came from two old English words that meant good news. That came from a Greek word that doesn't sound anything like it. The Greek word is euagelion. You don't need to remember that, except for if you looked at euagelion, you would see a visual connection to the English words evangelism, evangelistic, evangel, evangelist, and evangelical. They're all related because they all point to the idea of good news. A lot of people today think evangelical is about being political. No. It's been hijacked and it's been morphed and twisted and perverted, but in its original definition, that word means somebody characterized by the good news of Jesus. Somebody who believes the gospel way to God, the good news way to God, instead of the hard work religious way to God. That's the differentiation. So good news, euagelion, evangel, evangelist, evangelistic, evangelism, good news. The word... Euagelion means herald. It means someone that is heralding and publishing good news. And it goes all the way back to about 300 years before Jesus when the city of Athens was coming into its prime in the Greek Empire. And the Persian Empire far to the east was expanding around the world because that's what powerful empires do. They expand and they take territory and conquer people. And so so the Persian king has sent an army of ships and a fleet of warriors and, and powerful weapons to the shores of Greece, and they're going to attack the city of Athens, and they're going to take over a part of Greece and, and make it a part of their kingdom. The Athenians at this time did not have a powerful army. They reached out to the Spartans, who were known as being these rugged warriors, and the Spartans refused to come to their aid at the time, Greece was just a bunch of little disjointed city-states. And so now Athens is on high alert that this army from Persia is coming to their shores and was going to land their ships at a city called Marathon, which is just 27 point whatever miles to the northeast of, the, of downtown Athens. And so the Athenians, against hope, they, they mustered up as much of an army as they could. They, they equipped their men as much as possible. They sent their men out to battle. The weak, the elderly, the, the disabled, and the, the children and the mothers and wives stayed back in the city 
living in fear and anxiety about what was gonna happen with this battle of the Persians. And the Persians were desperately feared. Nobody thought there was any chance for the Athenians to beat the Persians. Well, they set the battle as the Persian army came ashore. They were able to stage the battle at a part of Marathon that was lowland and wetlands. And so as the Persian army came ashore and began to confront the Athenian army, their chariots and their horses got stuck in the mud and it slowed the army down and the forces of nature and God's providence turned the battle and what do you know, but the Athenians defeated the Persians. And so there are the, the, you know, the Persians loaded up their ships and they retreat and start heading back home to the shame of the Persian king and the entire empire and the army of Athens is elated at the unlikely idea that they just drove back the most powerful empire in the world and so they're celebrating and then it, they realize all their wives and children and elderly are back in the city of Athens living in terror and fear and now there's no longer a reason to fear. And so they quickly ask for a soldier, they took that man who'd been fighting all day and they appointed him, they designated him to be the runner to go from Marathon back to Athens to declare the good news of the victory to the Athenians. This is a true story. The man who had been fighting all day, exhausted, takes off his armor, then begins to run. This is why we call them marathons today. So he begins to run to Athens and as he's approaching the city, the people of Athens see him coming and they're wondering, what is he going to tell them? And imagine this moment. He's either gonna tell them good news, good news would be the battle is won, victory is won, you're free to flourish and live in Athens, we're free. No work to do, no battle to fight, you're free. Nothing to prove, you're free. Or, good advice, good advice would be the battle's lost, the Persians are coming, run for your lives, fight for yourselves, save yourself. Are you with me? Yeah. So here's the key. If the battle is won, there's nothing to do but say good news. The battle's won. Receive the good news, celebrate the good news, live in the good news, it totally changes your life. If the battle is lost, there's no good news, and all that you can do is have good advice, and the good advice basically boils down to save yourself. Work hard, run for your life, save yourself. We have the same two choices today as believers or unbelievers. All the message of religion and philosophy is save yourself. You, you have to win the battle for yourself. You have to defend yourself. You have to exhaust yourself, saving yourself. And then Jesus steps into the picture and says, I came to preach the gospel. Because what they called the runner who ran from Marathon to Athens with the good news of the victory, they called him a euagelion, a runner and a herald carrying good news. And the man came into the city and said, you're safe, be at rest, you're delivered, the victory is won, it's already been fought on your behalf, and you're free. And then that runner collapsed of exhaustion and died right after he made the announcement. True story, look it up. Um, that's where the word gospel comes from. Here's my point. When God wants to give you a sense of who he is and what he's done for you and what this is, this thing we call Christianity and this thing we call church, the word he chose was euagelion. What he called Jesus who came running into time and space. What is the message from heaven? What is the message from creator, most high God? What is the message from the king of heaven? Hey, everybody, humanity, planet earth, peace on earth, good will toward men. We celebrate it at Christmas, but we have a hard time living in it. When God opened up the heavens and came running into time and space, his message to you was, I'm for you. I'm fighting for you, I'm dying for you, I'm rising for you, I am gonna win the battle for you. Receive the good news, receive the battle victory that is won on your behalf. That's why Jesus said, I'm come to preach the gospel to the poor. He's not just talking about economically poor, he's talking about people that are destitute, without hope. That's you and me, we're spiritually poor without Jesus. There's no way we can fight for ourselves. There's no way we can win the battle 
against sin and Satan and death. And so the gospel is good news, which makes everything about the Bible, hey, guess what? Genesis to Revelation, every single word of this book is designed to press good news into your heart. So, well, Carrie, there's some bad news in, in there. Of course there is, because without Jesus, there's nothing but bad news. Just like without an army standing in Marathon against the Persians, for Athens, there's nothing but bad news. So we gotta, to even understand that story, we've got to understand the Persian army is coming. That's bad news. And, and so Jesus, in his word, says, hey, death is coming. Judgment is coming. Uh, hell is coming. That's bad news. But here's the good news. And you got to understand the bad news to even really begin to wrap your brain around the good news. I just want you to understand, religion, like, like, contextualizes and defines God as a bad news deity. But God reveals himself as a good news God, as a redeemer, a savior, a mercy giver. So let's press in for the next few minutes. What does this good news mean? I want you to see number one, the gospel or the good news of Jesus saves us. This word gospel is mentioned 95 times in the New Testament and we're gonna see all 95 of them today. (laughs) First service laughed immediately. I cannot figure out the psychology between the two services. It's, you guys are the same basic people, but you're just in a different frame of mind at nine o'clock, I think, I don't know. First service, they just belly laughed immediately. You guys are like. <laughs> this real nervous like laughter. I'm just kidding, relax. Number one, the gospel saves us. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Get this, he is declaring to them again the gospel they've already heard many times. Why is that? Well, because in the first position, the gospel saves us, but we never outgrow the gospel. We struggle forever growing up in it and living in it because we keep defaulting back to our achievements and our good works and our efforts for God instead of letting those grow organically out of what he's already done for us. But it does start with salvation, being saved. And he says here, I preached it unto you which you also received. I want you to mark in your mind these people had a moment when they, in the first position, received the gospel. And to receive the gospel was to reject false gospels. You can't just add it to all the other narratives. You don't add Jesus to all the other gods just to cover your bases. You reject all the lies and you embrace the good news of your creator. But you don't just receive it. Look at the next phrase, wherein you stand. We're gonna come back to that idea at the very last point today. We never outgrow the gospel. And I not only need to preach it every Sunday to you and to myself, You and I, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every single day. Why? Is it because we need to be resaved over and over again? No, no, no. It's because that same good news that saves us should frame our entire lives, and we should live in light of that good news. I'll come back to that thought, but let's talk more about what it means to be saved. He says, wherein, so you receive the gospel and then you stand in the gospel, verse two, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you believed in vain. Verse two can be confusing if you don't understand the nature of the words. So let's break it down for a minute. He's not saying you can't be saved unless you continue to remember everything you've ever been taught. What he's saying is he's explaining that salvation is not, is not only the miracle of a moment. So I'm gonna make the stage a timeline. And when I was eight years old, I made a decision. I heard about the good news of Jesus, that salvation cannot be earned or achieved, and that it's a gift, and that Jesus paid for it on the cross. And as an eight-year-old kid, I said, thank you, Jesus, I believe in you, I trust you, and I want you to come into my heart and life and be my savior. This is in response to the word of God, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus called it being born again. So like any newborn baby, there's a birth moment. 
We celebrate our birthdays, okay, birthday. But then like any baby, there's the growing up. So we have a new grandson in our family, Cameron. He's a couple, three, three weeks old now. And he doesn't even really understand fully who he is, but he still is. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you're born in Christ, you are totally redefined. You're a new creature. You're adopted into the family, not because you deserve it, but because Jesus paid for that work to happen with his death and resurrection. So you're born. So being saved is all about the miracle of a moment, but it's not theologically incorrect to say you're also being saved in the sense of transformation. Do you follow? So, so when you're saved, the moment of trust, you're secure forever. You can never be plucked out of the hand of Jesus. But you're kind of still the same, practically the same person. And so Jesus begins from the inside out, transforming you. The word is sanctifying, changing, growing. And like any little child growing up in a family, he begins to work what happened into you, in you, out of you. And it starts to show up in your lifestyle. So in the gospel, we obey the Lord not to be saved. We obey him because we are saved. Does that make sense? Okay, little Cameron is gonna grow up and learn to obey his mom and dad. Why? Because he belongs to them and they love him. What kind of parent would say, you're not mine until you learn to obey me? You're, I don't love you until you're good enough. I don't love you until you're a good enough son or daughter. That's not the gospel. Okay, and if you're waiting to, for God to say you're good enough, you'll never hear that because Jesus was good enough. And that's where it starts. And because Jesus is good enough, in him, I'm good enough. So like on my own, no way. So this is the gospel orientation. It saves me, and now because I belong to God, now I'm a child in his family, like any child in a perfect home, like none of us have ever experienced, with perfect parents, can grow up in love and nurture and safety and provision so you can grow up in that with God. You are saved and you stand in this gospel unless you faked it. Verse two says, unless you believed in vain, unless it's all a scam and you're just deluding yourself and others. And then look at it, he says, I delivered unto you that which I received. Paul said, hey, I received it too. What did I receive? That Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and then he rose again. And the scriptures he's referring to are the Old Testament scriptures, which is why Galatians says that God preached the gospel to Abraham. What I want you to understand is this is not just a late in the game situation. This is not just a New Testament thing. This is an entire Bible narrative from Genesis to Revelation, all of the theology and the principles of the gospel. God has never related to mankind on the basis of man's good works for him. He, want, he, he can only relate to you on the basis of his mercy. But in his mercy, once he adopts you and saves you, he will grow you up and you become his workmanship created unto good works. In other words, you will want to good work and honor him and please him because of the love you've received. All right, so the gospel first saves me. I hope I'm clear on this. You cannot do anything to save yourself. A friend of mine uh, sent me a video not long ago of a piece, a work of art. It's a modern work of art on display at a museum. And this work of art was put together by two Asian artists named Sun Wan and Peng Yu. And it's a machine that is leaking hydraulic fluid. It was designed to leak the fluid that is keeping it alive. And then it was programmed to do nothing but scoop up the fluid and put it back into itself infinitely. Isn't this wild? So this machine has no purpose but to continually work to sustain itself, to continually clean up its own mess. This is success. This is life on planet Earth. This is life without Jesus. You know what happened to this machine? It started slowing down, and then it got slower and slower, and then it just quit. It's almost like it just said, I can't go on. 
the comments on YouTube, people feel so bad for this machine. It's, it's actually hilarious. Like, people are actually emotional. Like, it's, it's, it's you know. Hey, listen, the, the point of the artists is that we are that. We're constantly picking up and cleaning up our messes and achieving and performing to survive and sustain ourselves, and we're just doing the same thing. We're, we're hamsters on a wheel over and over. We're Sisyphus pulling the rock up the hill, pushing it up the hill, and then it rolls back down, push up the hill again, it rolls back down forever and ever. We're just living, 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 and no meaning, and then we just slow down and die. And you came to church to be encouraged by that good news today. <laughs> That's not good news, is it? That, is, that picture of your life and mine is why Jesus came and says, I wanna release the captives. I wanna bring good news to the poor. You have more value than that crazy machine. You can't keep cleaning up your messes. Let me set you free to be who I created you to be. Let me set you free to flourish. Let me save you so that you no longer have to fear death. You have a life after death. This is all what the gospel provides for us. So, First, the gospel saves us, the good news. Secondly, the good news of Jesus shapes us. I hinted at this, but I want you to see it again. Galatians 1, the church is in Galatia, a region in Asia Minor, were started on church, uh, Paul's first missionary journey. Right after Paul left town, some false teachers came in. These people had just been saved from the bondage of religious law keeping that they could never do perfectly and set free to grow up in Jesus and in his gospel and in his grace and love, and the Judaizers who claim to believe in Jesus come into town and go, hey, it's great that you believe in Jesus, but you still have to be circumcised, keep the Jewish festivals and feasts, keep all these laws of Moses. You still have to convert to Judaism too. There's a lot of churches today that are, that are like that. It's like, okay, you got saved, but now you still have to do these 15 things. It's almost like you have to pay back your salvation. And that's not how it works. So Paul writes them and says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel which is not another. It's not good news. He says there, there are people that are troubling you and they're perverting the gospel of Christ. And then he says twice in verses eight and nine, hey, whether it's me or an angel from heaven preaching to you another gospel, let anybody that perverts the gospel to you be accursed. That's strong language. I want you to see in chapter two, he says because of the false brethren unawares who were brought in, they came in privately to spy out our liberty. So people came into these early churches with agendas to false teach and draw the people back into bondage. It was calculated. He says they were spying out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour. He says I didn't even give them an hour. I didn't give them any influence or any hearing. Why? Look at the last phrase of verse five. That the truth of the gospel, life in the gospel, might continue with you. So here's my point, friend. The gospel is not just the day you got saved. It could be, and that could be today. The gospel is every day thereafter, and the work and the power, Romans 1, the gospel is the power of God. It is the presence of, of Jesus Christ and his spirit and God the Father at work in your life, bringing about transformation that you could never bring about. And so it is literally the idea of being reshaped by Jesus and it continues, a slow, steady lifetime of sanctification. I love what Tim Keller said in this way. He said, Christianity is not a vitamin boost, it's a sweeping revolution. A lot of people think Jesus is a vitamin boost. Like, hey, I'm pretty good, I'm paying my bills, I'm honest, I'm living nobly and honorably, I'm doing my best, not perfect, but I'm doing my best, and you know, working hard, I'm exercising at the gym. I'm trying to eat right. Oh, you know what? I even added religion. I even added spiritual. I'm spiritual. I believe in Jesus. Sure. We'll add a little vitamin boost. And here's the idea. I was almost good enough for God to save me. I was almost good enough for God to love me. I almost got there. And Jesus came along. And thank you, Lord Jesus. You came along and you just nudged me over the finish line. That is a very small savior and a very small salvation. And that is not what Jesus said he came to do. He didn't say, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me to preach the gospel to the really good. 
to make them even better. He didn't say the Spirit of God is upon me to preach the gospel to people that are almost there to get them over the finish line. He said, no, I came to preach to the poor, the destitute, the hopeless, the people that are totally spiritually impoverished and have no hope of saving themselves. I came to the broken and the bruised and the wounded and the outcast. I came to the flawed and the failed. Listen, the starting point of salvation is if you're not broken and sinful and wounded and destitute and poor, you can't be saved. You, 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 you start at the bottom. You bring nothing to the table. God owes you no salvation or me. But he loves you unconditionally and infinitely. And he says, I'll do all the work. And I'll not only save you, I'll adopt you. I'll not only set you free and make you liberated, I will liberate you into my family. And I will work with you and in you and change you, transform you for the rest of your life. How does the gospel shape us? I made a list. I don't have time to talk about all of them, but I'll show you the words. It totally shapes us personally, privately. It shapes our whole theology, theologically. It shapes our whole ministry philosophically. It's what the churches should be dominated by. It shapes us missionally. What do we engage in? What do we do? It shapes us relationally. How do we forgive and forbear and tolerate each other? How do we tolerate the stink on the inside? The gospel and it shapes us practically. There isn't a situation in your life that isn't informed by the work of Jesus and by the orientation of relating to him not on the basis of your works, but on his. We'll talk about that more in another week, but I want you to see thirdly and quickly, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, secures us. So help me out, church. In the first point, the good news what? Saves us. In the second thought, the good news shapes us. If you keep following Jesus, you will not be the same person 10 years from now that you are today, and 20 years, and 30 years. You know what's beautiful about a church? Everybody in this room is growing at different places and different rates, and God's doing all this amazing, miraculous internal work in all of us, and that's why we can, we all ought to be wearing T-shirts that say, be patient with me, excuse my mess, I am under construction. (laughs) You know, construction is awesome after it's done. I hate construction because it is such a mess. It's messy. And everybody, you you need to just imagine when you come to church, everybody you see in the room has a t-shirt on. Excuse my mess, I'm under construction. And that's why the New Testament tells us we can forgive each other, we can forbear each other, we can tolerate each other. Because someone else's mess annoys you but before you get too irritated, your mess annoys somebody else too, okay? Now we're kind of all there, and we all need Jesus. But the gospel secures us. What do I mean by secure? Well, look at three verses, and then I'll give you a few words. The first one is Romans 16. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. I think of a tree deeply rooted that cannot be blown over by the strongest storm. Lots of trees topple when strong winds come. Connecticut, North Carolina, Florida, wherever. But the strong ones, the healthy ones, they just stand, okay? Establish. 1 Thessalonians 3, to the end that he may establish your hearts. I want you to think of strength, durability, surety, security. I want you to think of the heart component of that. That's emotional, that's psychological, it's your internal world. 2 Thessalonians 2.16, now our Lord Jesus himself and God, even our Father, which has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. We are in with God and nothing can take us away. We are much loved. We have a consolation that's comfort, that is everlasting, and we have eternal hope. So how does this gospel secure me? Three ways, internally, externally, and eternally. Say those with me, ready to go. Internally, (laughs) externally, eternally. Internally is emotionally and psychologically. What's going on in your inner man? You are absolutely, infinitely loved in Jesus and nothing can change that. You cannot earn more, you cannot lose his love. On your worst days, he loves you just as much as on your best days. 
He knows you all the way to the depths of your being and loves you beyond the moon, and nothing can ever change that. So in that love, you can grow up durable. How does the gospel change? How does, I want you to get a sense of this. How does that mean this gospel changes me? Let's go back to the marathon and the Athens story for a minute. Let me ask you this question. How does the news of the euagelion, of the runner, change life in Athens? I think we could say it is 180 degree polar opposite now. Life without the victory, the people of Athens are in darkness, hopeless, vulnerable, and their life is fight for yourself, run, hide, live in fear, live in anxiety, and do whatever you have to do to survive. And that sounds like life in America in the 21st century without Jesus. Dark, hopeless, struggle, hide, run for your life, look out for yourself, do everything you can to survive because it's all up to you. That's religion's narrative, that's philosophy's narrative. Religion and philosophy are the same. They both, they're two, they're two starting points that go exactly to the same destination. And the same destination is you're on your own. Save yourself. So if the Persians are not defeated, life in Athens is deathly. But if the Persians are defeated, what happens in Athens? The people are free. And they're free to flourish, they're safe. And in safety, they can be a thriving city. They can grow farms. They can build homes. They can write dramas. They can build musical instruments and write songs. And they can write stories and mythology. And they can, they, they're, they're free to create a culture that has become the roots of entire Western society for the last several hundred years. Do you realize so many aspects of our life today? Some of you go home and watch football today. Some of you have been to a drama on Broadway in New York City recently. Some of you have been to a concert recently. Do you know where that all goes back to? Athens. Coliseums and athletic competitions and dramas. Where did that all come from? A battle at Marathon when the Persians didn't get to control everything. Here's what I'm telling you. Because Jesus won your victory, when you let him come into your life, your life changes as dramatically as it did for Athens on the day of that victory. Now it's up to you the rest of this week and the rest of your life to tease that out because the implications are infinite. Internally, externally, materially, that's Jesus said, I'll provide your needs. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'll take care of you. Say, what about the economy? What about the election? What about the president? What about this, what about that? Listen, we should adapt, we should be wise, we should be strategic, but we shouldn't be worried. Why? because we belong to a father who takes good care of his kids. And he said, don't be worried. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. He said, fear not. And so, I just happen to believe him. I say, pastor, are you afraid of whoever wins the election? There's a part of me that's afraid no matter who wins the election. And that's like 1% of me. But the other 99% is like, ah, God's got it all. I'm his kid. I'm not gonna get swept up in the, in the drama. What you are witnessing in the, in the secular drama is people without Christ and without hope fighting over the, all of them fighting over the same loaf of bread. Millions of people fighting over a loaf of bread. And with you and Jesus, you can step out and go, I know a God who has huge farms and I can bake all the bread I need because I'm his kid. I don't need to fight over that crusty, moldy old bread. That's why John said, love not the world. The world doesn't love you. It's good news. I want to encourage you, if you don't know Jesus, if you've never received the gospel of your salvation, today you can. In a minute, we'll see some people baptized who have already made the decision to receive Jesus. They're not receiving him in these waters and baptism does not save. If you came from a tradition that taught you you had to be baptized to be saved, that's a false teaching. That is not biblical. 
Jesus did all the work to save you. So what they're standing here to do is to publicly testify to you of their salvation. But if you've never been saved, if you've never trusted Jesus, today is, there's no better day. And I wanna show you how. We're almost done. I um, saw a story this past week. So I was tracking the news of the hurricane and churches there and uh, so many people and displaced and lost so much. And so Friday morning, I, I had on the news and I was watching, it was early, it was, the sun hadn't even come up yet. And I was watching and there was a weather report from a guy in Atlanta. This guy's name was Bob Van Dillen. He's uh, part of a Fox affiliate in Atlanta. And he's standing on a road in the dark with a microphone giving a report about a road that's flooded behind him. And about 50 to 75 yards behind him, maybe a little further even, is a car submerged all the way up to the top of the, or the, 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 the beginning part of the driver's side window. You can see the window, but none of the car, all the rest of the car is underwater and this water is rushing down this street. And Bob is giving his report, and there's this, you can hear on the report, it just transfixed me. Usually I got the news in the background or whatever, and and so as I was getting ready for the day, and and I'm looking at this news report, and you can hear this woman screaming in terror for help. And it's just, any viewer just would rip your heart out. You're just like, someone is terrified. And he kept getting distracted. He's trying to talk to the viewers and, and he keeps turning around and talking to the lady and he keeps saying, I called 911, the fire department's coming, they'll be here in a minute, you're gonna be okay, we've got you. But still, this water in this woman's car and she's terrified and she's screaming and screaming. So finally, the weatherman is just overcome. You can see he's distraught and he says, I, 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 I gotta push it back to you guys in New York City. I'm gonna see if I can help this woman. So they cut away and they started covering other things. But I'm sitting there like, what's going on for this lady? And, you know, and so um, I was teaching at a teacher's convention. So this is Friday morning and I go to the airport in Indianapolis. So I packed my bags, I left the hotel, got to the airport. So it's a couple hours later now and the sun's up, it's about eight o'clock. And um, I'm sitting in the airport, I'm gonna start to study for my message and work on my outline, and I, I'm like, I gotta know what happened to this lady. So I'm, I Google, you know, weatherman, lady, drowning, flood, whatever, and I find this video, and this is what I saw. So as we're watching this video, I'm, I listened to Bob retell the story, which he was very humbly um, not really wanting to do, This man had set his phone down in his wallet, set his keys down, and given the microphone to his cameraman, and he just risked, who knows what he's gonna step into, who knows how hard the current's flowing, what the temperature of the water is, how much time he can endure that. He trudged out to chest high deep water to that lady's car, unbuckled her seatbelt, helped her out of the car, and here's what he said, get on my back, I'll carry you to safety. So, This sweet lady who could not save herself needed a savior. I'm watching that, some of you are crying, I was too. I'm watching that video and I'm thinking that is exactly what Jesus did for me. You brought nothing to him, he came running to you, you were trapped beyond saving, but he came. And he said, climb up on my back, I'll take you to safety. That is salvation. Receiving that work and trusting Jesus alone, holding to nothing but Jesus, not a church, not a baptism, not a pastor, not a priest, uh, Jesus alone, that's salvation. And once you receive him, your life is never the same. And that same gospel shapes you, shapes us all, and by virtue of that, it shapes the church. And that same gospel permeates every part of our lives as a church. And that same gospel secures us with a hope that lasts forever. Let's bow together and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for the power of the gospel. The church is a good news idea. The gospel is good news. So I pray that we as believers would let that good news run free in our lives, free in our church, free in New England. And I pray for those who've never trusted you that right now they would. 
with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I just wanna ask you for just a moment before we baptize to focus on a response and a reflection personally. If you're a believer, it would not be inappropriate to just collapse again into the gospel and say, Jesus, I desperately need your help. I'm tired of trying, I'm try- tired of working hard, I'm try- tired of orienting my life towards you on the basis of my work, me saving you, me doing for you. I wanna grow up in the gospel. And as believers are praying, I wanna speak to you if you don't know for sure if or when you receive Jesus Christ as your savior, I wanna encourage you that today could be the day, right now, this moment. Don't worry, I'm not gonna get weird. It's just a private decision in your heart. But if you believe that Jesus died and rose for you as God and wants to save and adopt you into his family, all that's left is to receive it. Tell him, Jesus, I choose you. I receive you. I trust you as my savior. Jesus, I know I'm sinful. I know I need a savior. I know I can't save myself. But I believe you died and rose again, and I believe you are the only savior. So please come into my life and save me. He will always answer that prayer. You don't need to pray it more than one time. New birth happens the minute you pray that prayer sincerely. If your decision today is to choose Jesus as your savior, we wanna cheer you on in that new relationship. We're not gonna hassle you or make you feel awkward. We have a Bible and a book and some other resources that we've put together in a box for your new walk with God. So if you have just prayed and trusted Jesus, on your way out, make a beeline to the tables in the back and tell the folks there, I chose Jesus today. I trusted Jesus today. And they'll be glad to give you these resources. So I'm gonna pray for you now and I'm gonna pray for these that are gonna be baptized and then we will celebrate their baptism and be on our way. Lord, thank you for the power of the gospel. Thank you for the 18 people who are standing before us to profess that they have trusted you. Bless them, bless their family and friends that are here. Bless these that have trusted you as Savior. Help them to grow forward in your grace. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the gospel of Jesus saves us. And friend, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, I hope you will as a result of watching today's message. But secondly, the gospel of Jesus shapes us. It doesn't just end with being saved in a moment it continues to grow up in us and it totally reorients our lives. The gospel reshapes us and it reshapes churches. When the gospel's alive and running free and growing free in a church, it reshapes that church because there's new life and there's health flourishing. But also the gospel secures us. And maybe as the storm outside is is billowing the storm of of our lives the storm that we called the war uh, call this world the chaos that's growing and the confusion all around us the gospels are good news it holds us together it gives us eternal hope it secures us internally psychologically it secures us externally materially and it secures us eternally (laughs) and you can't have a greater security I hope today's blessed and encouraged you. This is our first stop on the journey of, of, uh, of what it means to have a healthy church. So as I share this with you, I'm the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church of Newington, Connecticut, and we've been watching God cultivate health in our church for the last 12 years. And I want you, I want to ask you to pray that we will continue to see God sustain that health um, be, beyond my tenure, okay? That's my prayer. Thank you for joining me today, my friends. Love to read your comments and hope you have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.